The Ohio House picks a new speaker and gets back to lawmaking. Joining us on Columbus on the Record this week, Jesse Balmert, State House reporter for the Cincinnati Inquirer. Ann Fisher, host of All Sides with Ann Fisher on 89.7 NPR News. Sandy Tice, Democratic strategist, and Mark Weaver, Republican strategist. It took two months, it took nearly a dozen rounds of voting, but the General Assembly has a new speaker of the Ohio House of Representatives. The 11th ballot is as follows. 44 votes for Representative Smith, 27 votes for Representative Strayhorn, 13 votes for Representative Thompson, 7 votes for Representative Hughes. Having received a plurality of all the votes cast, Representative Ryan Smith is hereby declared elected Speaker of the Ohio House of Representatives. Smith of Bidwell fell two votes short of a majority of House members, but clearly was the top choice to succeed former Speaker Cliff Rosenberger. The vote ended an eight-week battle to succeed him and highlighted divisions among House Republicans. I stand here today fully aware of the division that exists in our country, in our state, and in some cases, divisions that exist within our own political parties. But as leaders who have been called upon by our constituents to represent their interests here at the State House, we must find within ourselves the strength to put our divisions aside and join together to honor our sacred commitment to those we serve. Jesse Balmer, what was the mood after the vote? Will bygones be bygones? Well, I think it was a bit of a mess, but we got there. So we have a new Speaker of the House, and we can go back to making laws here in Columbus. Um, but the sheer fact that it took 11 rounds of voting and Ryan Smith had 44 votes throughout the whole process, which took several hours, it, I think everyone is just ready to get out of there by the time we were done. But were there, were there signs that, you know, the householder faction, the vote, the 20 or so Republicans who kept voting for others, they might be willing to work with the new speaker? Any signs of that early on? So I think they are all saying that they're willing to work with the, the new speaker. I think what will be interesting is when we come to these controversial or close votes and whether Larry Householder supporters are going to get on board with Rep. Ryan Smith. That's going to be the true test of this. The next day we went through 28 different bills and resolutions, most of which were had bipartisan support and support from Democratic co-sponsors. So the next day we were really looking at bills that everyone can get behind. The test is going to be when we hit bills that not everyone can get behind. Mark, is this a is this over now, is it, or is this going to be a lingering concern for Republicans, especially those in the House? I think the strategy is pretty clear. Representative Smith's team thinks that they can use the next several months of this session to impress upon some members who might be wavering in their support for Speaker, Speaker wannabe Larry Householder uh, that he can run the House and do well. Uh, that, that we'll see. If he can, he may actually be able to win over some of those folks who are in the House now or some who will be elected come November and are watching from the outer edges. But it's, uh, he's going to have to do something in order for that to happen. Mm. And do you expect bold leadership from Ryan, ha Ryan Smith? I mean, we just have a few sessions left before summer. Then they're off until November. Then it's the lame duck session after the election. Right. I expect him to carry on in the path set by his predecessor, um, that who picked him in the first place. And I don't know if that's bold or not. It may be. Uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, maybe it's bolder yet to uh, take into account some more of the people from the other side. And of course, we're not talking about the other side of the aisle here. We're talking about the same side of the aisle, other side of the party, uh, which is uh, not quite as, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it's, it's going to be interesting whether you can pull them together. But um, business as usual, I, I don't know what that's going to look like uh, coming up on the, the uh, vote after they get back uh, in the new session, um, it's. Uh, I was kind of interested in what you said about whether people will he'll be able to sway people that were for householder. And you know, the reason why people were for householder has a lot to do with the kind of support householder showed them in the election. And I'm not sure they'll sway from that. Sandy, will Democrats hope to be able to work with this new speaker because the the House has been very conservative the past several years. A lot of far right bills getting approved. Democrats just voting no and. Uh, voicing their opposition and going home. 
Uh, I don't see any sign that they're going to work with them on the partisan stuff, but the stuff like Jesse referenced that everybody could get behind is they'll continue to do that. The real test is Larry Householder got involved in about a dozen primaries, and his candidates won every one of those primaries but one. So there's a whole new influx of Larry people coming in, and the people who he supported and the, ish, the, the special interests that supported his candidates those are the pay-to-play crowd. It's going to be a wild ride to see Larry trying to come back. Doing quick math, Jesse, 12 new candidates coming in, 20 consistently voted against Smith in this round. You know, that's 32. That's still not enough to become speaker. The math is going to be really interesting. You figure some of these people could lose to Democrats in November. That could happen, and that could pull from either Smith or Householder supporters. And then Ryan Smith does have this period of time, like Mark said, to prove that he would be the best speaker for this job. So I think getting this position was really helpful to his bid next year, but whether he'll be able to keep it really depends on the makeup of the House come the end of the year. Mark, should Larry Householder get another shot at being speaker? He, he, was, he was praised as an effective leader when he was a speaker the last time. Worked well with, I think, Governor Taft at the time. Got a lot of things done, but he left with a, with a cloud. Should he get another crack at it? I don't get a vote, but the folks who are elected in the Republican caucus get a vote, and I'm hopeful that they have their eyes wide open as to what they're getting. Those of us who were around during that era know the sort of leader that Larry Halsorter was. He doesn't hide it. And so those who want to know can read and talk to folks who are there and make a decision of whether they want that style of leadership. I doubt it'll be much different than what we saw last time. And this was a kind of an ugly, very public process. Kind of. <laughs> yes, more than kind of. Definitely was. But it was public. It was out in the open, where perhaps in the past it was just as ugly, just as nasty, but it was behind closed doors. And we didn't get to see it. They all come out and they vote unanimously for the new speaker. Hi, we're all together when they're really not. Which is better? Oh, I, I think this is better in a way. Um, I think, though, that it's, it, the reason this occurred was inevitable. When a party controls so much of state government like the Republicans control the state of Ohio's government really everywhere, uh, you're going to have that kind of cannibalism. They're going to be eating their own at, at, in the end. And this was inevitable. I mean, it took a few years to get to, but it's not unusual when you have such dominance by one party. So Either party, Democrats or Republicans. Yeah, absolutely. All right, once the speaker took the gavel, the House wasted no time in getting back to work. It passed nearly 30 bills in its first day back. Among them, what advocates hope are loophole-free limits on payday loan interest rates. The House voted to cap rates at 28 percent, something they thought they did a few years ago. But the lenders were able to get around those rules and charge huge interest rates through some legal maneuvering. This is the bill that was stuck in the House under the leadership of Cliff Rosenberger, when the FBI started asking questions about Rosenberger's trips with payday lending industry lobbyists, the bill suddenly became unstuck. Mark Weaver, is this good public policy, this overwhelming vote, or just running for political cover? Well, it's an election year, so you have to presume that every vote that's taken has some political calculation to it. Clearly, there's been some urging by editorial boards and other advocates to move the payday lender bill, and I think that was heard. Because it's caught up in whatever's happening, with the FBI and Cliff Rosenberger, I think people felt even more impelled to do something with it. Uh, we don't know. Nobody really knows what the issue is quite yet. We've heard little, little clues here and there. But I think the House clearly thought the better part of valor was to move it off its agenda and, and out to uh, where it could be approved. Jesse, the surprise was there was no negotiating, at least on the House side. The payday lending industry they basically they took the advocates' version of the bill it, with, the, with the strict restrictions and moved it forward. Yeah, there was one point in committee where there was going to be some pretty substantial changes, which were kind of last minute, and that got shuffled away. So I think what you're really going to see is this bill go over to the Senate, and if there's going to be any tweaks, it's going to happen there. Payday lending and restrictions on this particular industry are con controversial in a regular time, and even more so with Cliff Rosenberger. So I think the Ohio House is just saying to the Senate, like, hey, if there need to be fixes, you guys can take care of that. It, th I don't think it's just the editorial pages and the advocates who wanted this. Um, we passed a 28 percent rate cap 10 years ago. And the payday lenders put a referendum on the ballot, and they were out, they outspent the good guys 60 to 1, and they got beat 2 to 1. 66 percent of the voters said 28 percent rate cap is fair. 
and not four or five hundred percent like we're seeing. I think there's strong public support for this, and the reason why nothing's happened over ten years is because of all the money the lenders give. But if anything's clear, uh, the payday lender group, they still have a ton of money, and uh, whatever passes, whatever happens in the Senate, and whatever passes in the long run, they'll be hard at work, nose to the grindstone, trying to figure out how to get around that, too. Well, and what's interesting, we, have, we suspect that what's going on with Cliff Rosenberger is tied to payday lending. The four legislators who've been convicted over the last couple of years, all, all four Democrats, two of them were caught up directly in the pay to lenders. So three in the House, one in the Senate. Not just guesses, not hints, but convicted on corruption charges. So we know that there's, there may be more to come. So is this, a, is this the end of the payday lending's overwhelming influence or strong influence at the State House if the Senate passes this? Well, the First uh, Amendment allows people to go to the legislature and say, this is what policy I'd like you to pass. And there are certain, and I don't work with the payday lending industry, but I, there are certainly lots of people who use it and want to be able to have the ability to use it. Um, given what's happened now, I'd be surprised if we saw something in the near future, but people who want to have a business are going to try to find a way to do business. When they worked around the last law, they didn't do it out, and they did it behind, you know, behind the scenes. They weren't doing it out front of anything. They weren't doing it through the legislature. They were doing it with their lawyers. Lawyers. So that's what I figured they'll probably uh, work at this time, do a run and run again, and then the lawmakers or the voters will have to come back. Cindy, the supporters of the industry say that this will put them out of business, that there are a lot of low-income people in particular that need these loans to tie them over from the last couple of days of the month until they get paid. They need these short-term loans. What is your response to that? They can make money charging 28 percent interest. That's a lot of interest. They're not going to go out of but business. These are risky borrowers, and that's the argument. You they are, they are risky borrowers, but still, this industry can flourish. A lot of credit unions give these types, these small loans, and they grow and prosper too. Uh, these, these arguments are ridiculous. When does it come before the Senate, Jesse? You know, I don't think they've said it yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if there is similar pressure to make sure this doesn't languish too long in the Ohio Senate. So, so I think you'll see it move relatively quickly, but I, like I said, I wouldn't be surprised if there are some changes or at least some attempts at changes over on that side. All right. State law says Ohio's medical marijuana program must be up and running by September 8th. Well, that's not going to happen. After a permitting process plagued by problems, the state this week announced it will not meet that deadline. It has fallen way behind on inspecting marijuana growing facilities and all the miracle grow in the world won't have the plants <laughs> ready to harvest marijuana by the end of summer. And Fisher, the saying in the cornfield is knee high by the 4th of July. <laughs> What's the saying in the greenhouse for marijuana growers? Uh, the buds aren't ripe yet. I, I'm telling you, <laughs> they, I, 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 I don't know what they were thinking. I mean, two years ago when things got off on such shaky ground right off the bat, you know, anybody who understands agriculture knows that this is going to be complicated to get going and why the state of Ohio refused to look at best practices in other states, I'll never understand. Why they split it up between three different agencies, I will never understand that. Uh, they still don't know, the, the left foot doesn't know what the right foot's doing. They still had complaints at the latest meeting of this commission uh, from people on the commission saying, why do we have to read about it in the paper that it's not going to be ready until September 8th? That's a signal. That's an, a, a symptom of a much deeper problem with this. And they're saying it's really a matter of weeks and maybe a few short months before they do get going. Well, I, 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 don't, I just I find that hard to believe. I think it's going to be a lot longer than that. Is it just the state's fault? Because we they, they sort of implied that the growers haven't been ready. The one inspection they had, Jesse's, the, um, the, they failed. The grower failed the inspection. So, so I think it is a combination of factors. I think, like Ann was saying, there are multiple different agencies that have been delayed in getting out some of these licenses as offers to cultivators and dispensaries. But I also spoke to one of the larger marijuana cultivators in Yellow Springs in southwest Ohio, and he said they broke ground in December, and it was a wet and a cold uh, we were all here for the Ohio winter this year, and so they are, you know, further behind than they planned on being at this point. So I, I, I do think there are multiple factors, but when you're already kind of behind on rolling it out, if you have any little hiccups with the weather, it just, you know, becomes that much more problematic. Both the state and the growers have some responsibility for being late. The state, however, does not have the typical stoner excuses of <laughs> I lost my car keys, <laughs> had to stop to buy Doritos, <laughs> and I know I have that paperwork here somewhere. Right. So the state's got more explaining to do, I think, than the growers. They didn't even do the math right when they scored them. 
It's like, really? Nobody double-checked your math? Every step of the way, like Ann said, there were problems. And so, it, it's... So you, are these rookie mistakes, Sandy? Are these inherent problems? Or some conspiracy theorists think that they deliberately put the brakes on this to I, delay that? I think the way possible. we structured it is insane. Um, a lot of states that are already in the business and do both recreational and medical, they made a lot of mistakes, and we could learn from those mistakes. I don't know why we didn't. I have no idea why we structured it this way, but hopefully somebody will fix it. The dispensary list came out this week. Five places will be able to sell marijuana with a prescription in Columbus. Any surprise on the on the locations? They're spread around the city pretty well. Mm -hmm. One on the east side, one on the west side. A couple. I think they one, have to one spread them around. One by the around. casino. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can get a headache yeah. when you lose a lot of money. Part, part of the regulation was these had to be in certain zones yeah. all the way across the state so that not all of them were clumped in Cleveland or down in Cincinnati. And so that was part of the design to make sure these were accessible to patients across the state. But there's nothing to put in them yet, so too bad for the people who uh, <laughs> might be, uh, you know, get the prescriptions and can't avail themselves of it. Mark, you've watched politics for a long time. How long is it before pot is completely legal in Ohio? It's hard to say. We, we can't forget that it's still illegal as a matter of federal law, which is going to create court cases about conflict of the law between state and federal law. So obviously other states are further out ahead of us on that. So part of this is going to be watching the courts to see whether they will allow uh, federal law to be essentially ignored in those states where it's become legal. Do you think that eventually, like casino gambling, you, you just knew it was a matter of time before casinos got here? Well, we, it was clear that medical marijuana was going to come. The, the polling had been getting stronger all the time. The polling is moving much more slowly on the notion of recreational marijuana. And we're seeing states like Colorado starting to see some problems because of their leap into it. And so other states like Ohio are probably being more cautious. Sandy, does, does the problems with getting this system started help the recreational marijuana effort, or does it hurt the recreational I, marijuana? I think it helps. I think the voters will do it before the politicians. Politicians are always so nervous about it, and they see the downside to something like this. But I think people want recreational marijuana. Regulate it. I think when it gets to the tipping point, you know, and I, I agree, the numbers are creeping slower, more slowly than it did for medical marijuana, but they are creeping upward, you know, with every new batch of 18-year-olds. Um, we have a new batch of voters that are for it. But uh, I think that it's going to hurt them in the long run because the voters are not going to trust them next time to do, do things the right way uh, through the state government. The voters are going to take it into their own hands. I don't think they trust them. But, Jesse, what if it, you know, say it's only delayed a couple of months, they get it going, it's working well, the folks who need this medicine get it, they rave about how it's helped them, there's really no problems from this point on. You can yeah. say, look, we, we done it, the people who need marijuana have it, we don't need to have everybody have it. So I do think, well, no one's going to give Ohio an A-plus for this effort. A lot of other states have been delayed. Like you said, we could have learned from those efforts. But it's not surprising, perhaps, for those who've been watching this rollout that this wasn't going to happen on time. We even spoke with uh, a woman who's, whose daughter has epilepsy and was just like, I kind of saw this coming. So yes, I think it's a credibility problem, but also will a ballot initiative group be able to take it on? I think it really depends on who's involved involved in the ballot initiative group. We saw issue three, you know, go down soundly because yeah. people didn't like the way it was worded. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on the group. All right. Even though natural gas has cut into Ohio's energy market, we still get about 60% of our electricity from coal-fired power plants. The Trump administration is trying to keep it that way, at least for a couple years. It wants to require regional transmission operators to buy power from coal and nuclear plants for two years. The president says coal plants are closing at an alarming rate, and that threatens the nation's electric grid and, as a result, national security. Environmentalists say the move is a bailout for the coal industry, which heavily supported Trump's campaign. Sandy, we do get 60 percent of our electricity from coal plants. Isn't it wise to keep that system strong at least for two more years? If you talk to the experts in the grid, they will all tell you that Trump's rationale is baloney. There's no national security threat. We can get uh, reliable power through the mix that we have right now. This is a bailout. And in addition to the charter schools and the payday lenders, the electric utilities are some of the biggest pay-to-play people on Capitol Square. First, energy made bad investments in coal and nuclear power, and they want us to pay for them. If this thing goes forward, everybody who has an electric bill will see their bill go up. 
coal is dirty, it's inefficient, it's expensive, so it's bad for the air, bad for the water, bad for the consumers. The manufacturing sector, which is real important to Ohio, doesn't like it because their electric bills are huge. So if it's bad for business, bad for consumers, and bad for the environment, why would you do it? Because the politicians like the money that the utilities give. Is this a Republican president picking winners, Mark, in this industry? No, this is a president who ran for office saying he wanted to see more domestic energy exploration. Uh, and overwhelmingly, voters are in favor of that, particularly voters, voters in Ohio. They understand that we want natural resources to supply most of our energy, not foreign resources. And I think there are lots of experts who will tell you this is a national security risk. We do not want to have to rely on other countries for our energy. But why not invest in renewables like wind and solar instead of coal? That's well, also that, domestic it depends on what source. you mean by investing, right? Right now, if you want to see your electricity rates go up, go to all solar and wind because right now it is in economically in inefficient. And so most of us supported a, 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 all approaches, right? All of the above, anything that will generate power. But the market moves towards efficiency, and right now people do want lower electric rates, and which means coal is the cheapest way to get it. If you look at the states around Ohio, Kentucky is like 83% of their electricity comes from coal, West Virginia 94%, no surprise there. But Michigan's only 30%, Pennsylvania is only 25% mm -hmm. of their industry or their electricity comes from coal. 25% in Pennsylvania, that's surprising, Ann, considering they're just as close to West Virginia as we are. Once again, I mean, why don't we look there. to those other states where they're making it work with less coal producing uh, electricity and uh, maybe we could learn something. But at this point, it, 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 it's, I don't know if people who voted for Donald Trump automatically, you can equate that as people who support propping up the coal industry. I'm not sure that that's, He made you know, no secret of his I think position. It's, he did not make any secret of it, but I don't think you can equip, you know, I think that's equivocating, and I, I'm not sure that that's appropriate. I think a lot more people would like to see more investment, and the question is how you invest in it, because right now, by by going in this route, it is a it is an investment in coal. So, uh, you know, I mean, the, the, the uh, uh, state has withdrawn investment in renewable energy uh, in, in various ways in recent years, and maybe they ought to take a look at that. The, the most efficient way to lower your bill is to promote energy efficiency, and that's what we need to invest in. It's interesting that when Larry Householder recruited his candidates, he recruited ones who supported a first energy bailout. That ought to tell you what you need to know about this industry. And that's the one that's before the state legislature, yes, Jesse, the helping first energy with nuclear plants and coal plants. Certainly, and that's something that Larry Householder, based on his contributions that he received and just generally seems to be supportive of, it's been interesting because uh, Republicans in the Ohio State House have been so opposed to helping out renewable energy, whereas this would potentially help out a different type of energy. So, I mean, is it free market grid or is it not? Yeah. Exactly. All right, we get to our weekly off-the-record parting shots. Mark Weber, you're up first. Something important happened this week that's worth noting. Uh, Sheriff Russ Martin from Delaware County had been stalked for the last 20 years by a sick man who really endangered the sheriff's family. And they withstood it with grace for 20 years, but the feds eventually indicted and convicted the guy. I was in court with Russ this week when he uh, told the judge what this had meant to him, and both he and his wife said they were praying for this defendant. This was the public servant who did the right thing, and people in Delaware County are well served by Sheriff Russ Martin. Sandy. A new study came out this week by Innovation Ohio, and so if you want to know how much money was siphoned away from your public school to pay for kids at ECOT, uh, and most of the kids in ECOT came from a higher performing traditional public school, you can go to the Innovation Ohio website, look up your local school, and uh, the numbers are staggeringly high. Yeah. Uh, whether you're watching this on Friday or Sunday, there's still time to head to the uh, uh, Columbus uh, Arts Festival. I mentioned this morning when I was on the air uh, saying that it was beautiful weather, and a half hour later, you know, the, the thunder struck. It was not fake news. Uh, it, was, <laughs> it was beautiful. It'll be beautiful, and there's lots to do and see there, so check it out. And Jesse. I guess one of the few entertaining parts of this very long speaker vote was uh, Democratic reps Jack Sarah had many adjectives for uh, Fred Strayhorn, the minority leader. So just like Fred Strayhorn, I hope you have an honorable, distinguished, venerable, noted, acclaimed, and illustrious weekend. All right. <laughs> bearded. All right. And bearded. <laughs> bearded. My author record comment, plug for our relatively new political podcast, Nala Gostler, Steve Brown from WOSU Radio, and I each week take an irreverent look at politics. Check it out wherever you get your podcast. For our crew and for our panel, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week. <laughs>